Greetings to you. This is Tony Denton coming to you again from Phoenix, Arizona area on this March the 7th, 2019. We're up to Lesson 7 of installments on the creation of my audiobook for Hebrews from Flaw to Flawless Fulfilled. We're up to Hebrews chapter 2, verses 12 through 18. And if you're following along in the book, that begins on page 45. So, on to Hebrews 2, 12 through 14. Here's some introductory notes. Genesis informs us that God created Adam in his own image and with a dominion which included a relationship with his creator that none else on earth possessed. However, God apparently wanted to be loved by him without any innate compulsion like robots to do so, provided him with a free will that he used to choose self over God. Since Adam broke his relationship with his creator by opting to commit sin, and since through thousands of years following that decision, it was demonstrated that no mere human could restore that relationship, Jesus, God's Son, then came on the scene to remedy this sad situation, at least for those who desire to be in fellowship with their creator. In studying chapter 2, 5 through 11, we learn that Jesus is superior to angels for two reasons. Number one, he, as God and not an angel, became human in order to mend man's relationship to his creator, thereby reestablishing his initial dominion. And number two, he was crowned as eternal king over the kingdom which consists of those who desire that mended relationship with God through his son, which of course is the only way to possess it. John 14, 6. Upon approaching the remainder of Hebrews chapter 2, one must also remember that most Jews had trouble not only with God becoming a man, but also with Jesus being the fulfillment of the Messianic prophecies, especially since he died a criminal's death by crucifixion. For surely that was confirmation that he couldn't have been the promised king. Although Hebrews 2 verses 12 through 18 continue the same subject matter of verses 5 through 11, they close out Paul's argumentation for the superiority of Jesus over angels. So, verse 12, I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the congregation. I will sing praise to you. Since Paul just stated in verse 11 that Jesus isn't ashamed to call sanctified ones his brethren, he went on to support his assertion by the use of three Old Testament quotations. The first one, a well-known messianic verse, Psalm 22:22. The Messiah was prophesied as saying to God, I will declare your name. To declare one's name simply means to speak of the character of the person behind the name. The phrase, to my brethren, is obviously the phrase that Paul meant to emphasize here. Just as David wrote hundreds of years prior, the coming Messiah, right alongside his new covenant age siblings, verse 11, would unashamedly worship their mutual father. The original term for the phrase sing praise is actually the term from which we get our word hymn. Even so, it doesn't necessarily mean to sing, for it can also merely mean to praise, as the term is actually translated in Psalm 2222 and even in some translations such as the Revised Standard Version. Verse 13, And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, Here am I and the children whom God has given me. Here's a side note. Lest one lose a sight of it, the main point here is that Jesus, because he became one of us, had to depend upon God just as other human beings, not for redemption for sin that he committed, of course, but in order to be made completely qualified to lead us, as sinners, to salvation. Verse 10. These two separate quotes in verse 13 of Hebrews 2 are from Isaiah chapter 8, verses 17 and 18. The first indicates that Jesus, as God's Son, placed his trust in God his Father, while the second indicates his close link to God's other children who are placed under Jesus' guardianship as the elder brother. Fits perfectly, of course, into this context. Verse 14, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, He himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. Compare that with 1 John 3, verse 8. The phrase flesh and blood was used by ancients to describe humanity in contrast to deity. The original term for shared 
refers to the voluntary acceptance of becoming human. That's what Jesus did, right? Because he lived before he was born a human. There's a different Greek term for being born human without the choice of being so. The original word for destroy literally means to render inoperative or ineffective as if no longer existing. This word is rendered as without effect in Romans 3 verse 3 and is, by the way, also found in 1 Corinthians 15 26, a very important verse in the study of death and the kind of death that the Bible is primarily about. That is, something that's spiritual, not physical. The word for power here isn't the term meaning authority. It's actually an antonym for destroy. For while to destroy means to render powerless, power here is the word for strength. Look at it this way. In Genesis 3 verse 15, God said that the head of the foe, here in Hebrews 2.14, the devil, the opposer, would be crushed by the Messiah. But in process of that crushing, the Christ's heel would be wounded meaning that crushing the enemy's head would come at a huge price, a brief separation from the Father, Matthew 27, 46. Why? Because on the cross, Jesus bore to sin, which brought about the death and separation of the two parties in the first place. Compare that with Genesis 2, 15 through 17, and Genesis 3, 1 through 24. So Christ, by taking sin upon himself in his sacrifice, began the process of, as Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, 26, rendering sin death powerless. Note the present tense of the Greek. A process that was accomplished when the law had been fulfilled at the demise of the Old Covenant Temple and its holy city around AD 70, 1 Corinthians 15, 56. Incidentally, by sin death is meant the severing of fellowship between God and man. Thus, by fulfilling and eliminating the law which gave sin its power, thereby in turn stripping sin of its power, death, and separation, all who so choose may be reconciled to, that is, made friends again with, the Father. There's a lot more along those lines that you can find on my website, In-Depth Studies of 1 Corinthians 15 and 2 Corinthians 5, for example, on a asiteforthelord.com under the End Times Studies page. Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, the fulfillment and consummation of the old covenant world and life, all conspired together to bring about the total crushing of the enemies of God and man and their relationship to one another. Not only was that which was physical and temporal, the Jesus despising Jews, taken care of, but also that which was spiritual and eternal, sin with its consequent death, was taken care of at least for those who accept this graciously offered gift of God. Just reflect on how great an encouragement it was to persecute the Christians when they read Paul around AD 57 saying that the God of peace will crush Satan shortly. Romans 16, 20. And check out my notes in relation to that at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 13. All right, verse 15 now. And in brackets I have, Jesus became a man that through death he might, and then the verse 15 goes on to say, release those who, through fear of death, were all their lifetime subject to bondage. The word release means to set free from something. The word fear is a translation of the Greek word from which we get phobia. And as John wrote, fear involves torment, 1 John 4.18. The phrase subject to bondage means held in slavery. Humans without Christ are slaves to fear the fear of separation from the Creator for all eternity, what many call spiritual death, something that's sealed by physical death if reconciliation isn't realized beforehand. No wonder Job looked upon death as the king of terrors, Job 18, verse 14. Death as a result of sin, Romans 6, 23, was made even more clear and potent by means of the law, Romans 7, because it didn't offer salvation, only condemnation, Galatians 3.19. This was the main flaw of the law, Hebrews 8, 6 through 7. Not that the law itself was faulty, but because man couldn't fulfill righteousness or become righteous through the law, Romans 7, 4, it was inadequate to reconcile man to God. In fact, notice how Christ's overcoming death was joined with the destruction of the law, 
and 1 Corinthians 15, 55, and 56. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus came on the scene as a human who lived the law perfectly, thereby fulfilling all righteousness, as well as the prophecies concerning the one who would bring in a new law of grace and life. By means of this accomplishment, he abolished the law of sin and death, Romans 8, 2, which provided the enemy with his great advantage over man. Now, through Christ, there's a blessing found in the idea of death, Revelation 14, 13. Verse 16, For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, that is, speaking of God, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. The word indeed here isn't the usual one, which means truly. This one carries with it a sense of praise, as if Paul were saying, Isn't it amazing? God doesn't give aid to angels, but he does give it to the seed of Abraham. Since Paul was writing to Jewish Christians, and since he had just stated in verse 9 that Jesus died for all races, we know he used the phrase seed of Abraham rhetorically. The truth is, as Paul said in Romans and Galatians, anyone, Jew or not, who chose or chooses to place his faith in Christ is a child of Abraham, Galatians 3.9 and Galatians 3.29. According to Kenneth Wiest, who offered a set of books called Word Studies in the Greek New Testament, the idea in this extended context seems to be that, quote, Jesus and his work on the cross didn't provide for the salvation of fallen angels, but for the salvation of fallen human beings. In perfect righteousness, he passed by fallen angels, and in infinite mercy and condescension, he stooped to provide salvation for man. He passed by a superior being to save the inferior being. Unquote. Verse 17. Therefore in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. The phrase, he had to be made, must be interpreted to mean that Jesus was obligated to save man who willingly broke bonds with him, for justice would have prevailed if he had not done so. So what does it mean? This verse itself explains it to mean that, due to Jesus' mercy, his desire to save us regardless, he had to be made human in order to fulfill the requirements of that salvation, meaning he had to keep his own laws perfectly. And we talked about that idea in the last study of Hebrews chapter 2 about Jesus becoming human and why, or in the study even before that one, earlier in chapter 2. The phrase, like his brethren, refers not to simulation, but to assimilation, meaning that Jesus, who is 100% God, was also at one time 100% man, in all things or in every way, according to this verse, verse 17. The phrase, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest, means that he's compassionate, constituting himself a faithful high priest. This means that, by becoming or being human himself, he could truly empathize with us. Hebrews 4, verse 15. The high priesthood of Christ is the keynote of the book of Hebrews. It was alluded to in chapter 1, verse 3, but this is the first time it's mentioned directly, setting the tone for the rest of the book. Having shown that Christ came to deliver mankind from the fear of death, Paul here showed that this was achieved in his role as high priest, something that's very fitting since in the Old Testament the fear of death was especially connected with the approach to God as an impure worshiper. Numbers 18 verse 3. This fear was relieved or removed by the intervention of the Levitical priest because it was his duty to discharge the service of the tabernacle that there might be no outbreak of divine wrath on the children of Israel, Numbers 18.5. In other words, the work of the priesthood was not without its stress. Perhaps in part because of the stress involved in this job, compassion as an attribute of priests isn't found in the Old Testament. On the contrary, the fault of the priests was their frequent lack of sympathy for the people. Compare that with Hosea 4, verses 4 through 9. In the latter part of Jewish history, that is, in the New Testament times, priests, especially the Sadducees, were notoriously unfeeling and cruel, so the idea of a compassionate as well as a faithful high priest was very appealing to Jewish readers. The phrase, things pertaining to God, as defined by the next phrase, simply refers to Jesus as fulfilling, once and for all time, 
the conditions of God concerning the reconciliation of man. Jesus, who is merciful to man and faithful to God, is our sacrifice on earth and our high priest in heaven. The word propitiation is more recognizable to us today by the term atonement or at one meant, a term actually invented specifically as a translation for that which or for one who restores. In this case, the relationship between God and man, that is heaven and earth, that was marred by sin. As John wrote of Jesus, he is a propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the whole world, 1 John 2, verse 2. So Jesus became like us, Hebrews 2, 17, that we might become like him, 1 John 3, verse 2. Much more along these lines may be found in the remarks on chapter 5 when we get to that spot in our book. All right, verse 18, last verse in this study. For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Recalling that Paul was writing to suffering Christians, it only makes sense that he'd essentially ask them, Why would Jesus become human, suffer and die for you, only to forsake you? Which, by the way, is exactly the idea with which he ended the book in chapter 13, verses 5 through 6. The point was that just because Jesus was gone from them in the flesh didn't mean that he was unconcerned and uninvolved in their lives. Rather, as demonstrated in the story of Stephen's stoning when he saw Jesus standing instead of sitting at the right hand of God, Paul wrote later in Hebrews 4.15 that Jesus is a truly sympathetic high priest. The phrase, he has suffered, brings to mind Luke 22:28, where Jesus seemed to imply to his apostles that his entire life, especially the 3.5 years of his ministry, was continually plagued with the suffering of trials. He said, you are those who have continued with me in my trials. The phrase, he is able, strikes at the heart of the matter. Jesus doesn't sympathize with us just because, as deity, he's aware of everything, but also because, having been human, he experienced what they were experiencing, that is, suffering. In fact, he warned his disciples, saying, Since they persecuted me, they will also persecute you, John 15, 20. And, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world, John 16, 33. The word aid, in verse 18 here, comes from a word which means to call for help or run toward a cry for help. These brethren needed to realize that, as Peter wrote, the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations, 2 Peter 2 verse 9, and that, as Paul also wrote, God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it, 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13. The word for tempted carries more the idea of being tried than it does what we think of as being tempted. These two concepts can't be entirely separated, but the idea of being tried by persecution fits the whole point of this letter much better than the idea of being tempted to commit sin. Okay, I will finish this by reading my translation of this section, verses 12 through 18 of Hebrews chapter 2, on page 306 of my book. I will proclaim your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. And again, I will be one having relied on him. And again, consider me and the children whom God gave to me. Therefore, since the children have participated in flesh and blood, he also voluntarily shared in the same thing, so that through his death, he might incapacitate the enemy who has the power of death and rescue those who, through fear of death, were held in slavery all of their lives. For he really is not at all rescuing angels, but he is rescuing the seed of Abraham. So in order for him to effect reconciliation for the sins of the people by being a merciful and faithful high priest in the services of God, it was necessary for him to become like his brethren in all things. And since he himself has experienced the act of being tried, he's able to run to the aid of those who cry for help as they're being tried. Well, once again, I thank you for being with me, for listening to this, and for subscribing to my audiobook as I share it with you once each week on Hebrews, From Flaw to Flawless, Fulfilled. Have a great week.